everyone, welcome to another edition of Founder Wisdom Podcast. Today we have Charles Fry, aka Carlos Fry. Uh, he is the CEO of Code Exitos. Uh, Charles slash Carlos, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, I think you've done a great job, Charles slash <laughs> Carlos. Um, yeah, I'm the CEO, founder of Code Exitos, and I'm excited to be here and, and go through the format with you. So I'm ready when you're ready. First, I need to ask, like your background, it's it's pretty damn cool. Like, what what is that painting? This, yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, this this painting is by a Honduran artist, and uh, you know, since we're all techies, uh, we didn't order this painting. By the way, uh, Julio, you know, he's on our website. Uh, he conceived of this. So on this side over here uh, is his vision of the primordial world. It's so much cool detail in this thing. Uh, but, but there is a long story on our website about it. So this is the primordial world. And then here in this age here, you can see the Mayan hieroglyph. This is the Mayan uh, number system and part of the Mayan calendar here. So the Mayans in Central America are really starting to evolve the concept of the number zero. It's kind of hard, to, weird to think about somebody inventing zero. Uh, but we had to have that concept. So then if we progress further over here and over here, what you see are actually he's embedded integrated circuits and some memory chips and that kind of stuff. So this is our current technological age. And it's just a it's just a badass painting. And as Please, soon as I like, saw it, I'm like, I'm buying it. I'm buying how, it. How much can I buy it from you? Like, I want that. No, nah, it's not. It, it's not for sale. But I tell you what you can do is uh, go out, find a link on our website for what we call the Creative Fellows, and you can learn more about Julio there. He has some other artwork. It's pretty cool. So nice, uh, man. thanks for noticing. Though. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like directly in my colors, you know, like space technology and then Mayan uh, history. That's civilization. It's pretty fascinating. Um, I want to talk with yeah. your background because I mean you've got like a whole lot of experience. Seems like you were part of the <laughs> the dot com boom and maybe the bus. Tell us a, a bit more about submitorder.com. Yeah, wow. Yeah, you have done some research. Submitorder.com was definitely in the first uh, dot com boom. You know, I'm kind of an old guy, so I'm 58 years old. You look young. And um, thanks. We uh, so submitorder.com was back when people were trying to figure out e commerce. And um, uh, a funny thing is, the industry was so new that I remember sitting in meetings, Carlos, where the marketing people would say, How do we spell e commerce? Is it like a big E <laughs> and a dash and the word commerce, or is it all one word? Like, we had big debates about that because nobody knew. Um, and so submit order was the first time I, you know, was out in Silicon Valley. My, my partners and I that started that company, uh, we landed a lot of venture capital back in the time. And, uh, yeah, we were part of the bust as well. Uh, we were, we were, a, we were a fulfillment company that helped large retailers ship, pick, pack okay. and ship the items in their e-commerce site. Um, we were getting ready to file for our public offering. Wow. when uh, the market collapsed hmm. and so you know we, we we went the way of a lot of the dot-com bubble we actually broke up most of the company we broke it up and sold it off uh, hmm. but didn't think that we were ever going to get the money out of it that we had invested so it was time hmm. to move on did you had shares of that of company several, or uh, oh yeah oh yeah i had I have uh, I long quit counting the shares and the share value that I watched go up and incinerate and go away. <laughs> so, but yeah, I had I had shares. It was a little it was a little painful at the time, but you you know you get past it. Yeah. So what was the feeling? Because like there was very few that made it past the dot com uh, bubble bust. Uh, you know, Amazon being one of them. What was the feeling at yep. the time? You know, because. To me, it seems like that from one day to the next, the excitement all got down, you know, after people realized that pet.com uh, didn't have any uh, future and companies like that. So what was the, the specific feeling at the time? Yeah. So there were there are kind of two things you have to remember about that period and venture capital funding in that period. Um, so venture capital 
follows a it, being a VC investor and being a VC backed company follow patterns almost like fashion styles over mm-hmm. time. And in the late 1990s, the pattern was that the venture capitalists would build a company up very rapidly. They'd, they'd infuse a lot of capital. You build it up very rapidly, mm-hmm. and then you took it public. Okay. So that was the way they exited. And Pets.com was built, literally was built from the beginning to do an IPO. That was their whole goal. Okay. So um, the, but the feeling for us at Midorder was particularly painful because we had a real company. We had a real positive uh, gross margin. Like we were making money. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, Amazon's fulfillment business is essentially what we were building. Amazon was still just selling books. Now, I never met Bezos, and he had a lot more success than I did financially. Maybe they were thinking about the same thing, but we essentially built the same sort of back-end infrastructure uh, that that Amazon eventually evolved. So for us, it was frustrating to watch the market collapse. We understood why the economic value was no longer there to be in as a $200 million investor. Uh, So in that regard, it was it was pretty painful because there was nothing intrinsically wrong with our business or our, okay. our idea, but the market just sort of evaporated on us. So yeah, that, the, that was the market wouldn't hear it. Sucky. Right, right. And when that market failure happened, uh, we waited for a while, a year or so, and there was just no clarity on when IPOs would start up again. Mm. And so the only legitimate financial decision was to you know to break this up and sell it off to people who incorporated it into more traditional businesses so bottom line did you have Great a question. loss over that one because i i kind of um, you know like my last supplement startup we we literally we didn't even sell it you know me and my partner we we didn't have time for that so we we're just like frig, frig off you know and uh, we're gonna take a 40 to 100k loss and that's it you know uh, did did you yeah. like make any uh, profits out of that did you guys break even or was it like a, a clear loss were you in, like literally in the red nah we didn't we didn't we didn't make any um we didn't make any money on it i don't think that we really lost a whole lot um but we didn't we we what we lost that was particularly painful was the paper value that we thought we had accumulated and we thought Your we dreams. Built, but uh, yeah a little bit and it was it was really frustrating as an entrepreneur I, you know I've, i've been a builder my whole life um the most frustrating part was to know that we were right fundamentally it was a business that the world needed And other people came along after kind of the tsunami of that financial crisis and did the same business and they were successful with it. So time, the, the frustrating part was just that we didn't get the timing right. Mm, the timing, but I mean, Amazon had a crappy timing too. What did they have different, you know, like did they have more capital to survive on this low oxygen environment for a while and then potentially thrive later on? Well, I think. I've been a while since I've uh, looked at the timeline on that, but when we started Submit Order, you could only buy a book on Amazon. I mean, mm-hmm. they were they were the world's largest bookseller. Mm-hmm. Now, history has been written that Bezos had plans to sell more than books, and of course, you know now they are and do. Um, but I don't, I don't know that they had branched out much beyond books and like CD-ROMs and you know media. Uh, mm-hmm. until after the dot-com crash. And, and then sort of when the, when the dust settled, they said, oh, wait, you know, we have a fairly robust fulfillment system. And, uh, you know, they got into the distribution business and then later into the cloud computing business. Uh, I don't know how much of that was strategy in advance. And I don't think they were doing it when we were building submit order. Uh, mm-hmm. UPS offered to buy us, um, but we turned them down. That, mm. that might have been idea. To me, like books were like a worse business than like 3PL at the time. But still, you know, I think I think it's mostly capital and good old, you know, hard grit. I think Bezos was working with his wife at the time and, you know, as a mm-hmm. co-founder and yeah, they were just hustling out, you know, and 
Well, I mean, I, I can't speak, but I mean, for, for what I've, I've read um, about it, also they were very scrappy, you know, working from cheap offices. And, and he also had like capital injection from his parents. I think they, they dropped like pretty much all their savings in his business. So he's been yeah. through some very tough times, you know, like, I guess he's rich as hell, but like, I mean, if we look as, at, his, at his telomeres today, I think we, they, they would tell a lot, you know, about the stress he suffered and so forth. But um, I want to move forward to your next experience after that, which, you know, you started your, your consulting firm. Um, I mean, yep. that's, that's pretty much safe, you know, like a consulting firm, like slash an agency, you're always kind of guaranteed to make money, especially if you stay small. Uh, you did that for 15 yeah. years. That's a, that's a lot of time. So tell me a bit more about that one. Yeah, I mean, uh, consultancy is just a nice way to, you know, be self-employed. Uh, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, uh, wasn't mad about anything. There was no reason not to do it. I, I, I packed a lot of small adventures into that longer 15-year hmm. span. You know, I, I helped some people do some, uh, tech company purchases. We did some acquisitions. We did some divestitures. Um, but it was, I was more like a hired gun, you know, as a freelance guy. I helped some, I helped some venture capitalists. They would want, um, I was at mid order. I was a chief technology officer. So I, I was able to learn what equity investors are looking for, as well as how the technology has to line up to execute a business plan and meet the financial needs. So I had some VC funds that would hire me to do like technical due diligence. They'd be looking at a company and I would get a phone call and they're like, we don't understand what the hell this company does from a technology <laughs> standpoint. Would you go, would you go look at it and, uh, you know, tell us if, if it's as cool as we think it is. Okay. And uh, so I would do that. Um, hmm. But, you know, always on the lookout. I hope I helped a few other people start some businesses. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was a lot of accumulated time of odd jobs, I guess. And then what brought you to accept the job like in 2011? Was it the financial aspect of it? Was it that they gave you some stock? Um, because, I mean, to, to go from entrepreneur, I mean, my dad did it plenty of time. He was a consultant and he, then he went at the CMO at another job you know and he's still um, entrepreneur to this day and i i've always been curious as for how why did he make the move you know was it financial on your side to come back to the employment market no not really um so i think the job you're talking about is pillar technology yeah and uh, it was some it was some guy that i knew and they were doing some really good work and I was kind of tired of being a solo kind of freelance hired gun guy. And I thought, yeah, you know, I like, I like being on a team, uh, super charismatic CEO, kind of Bob Myers, you know, ball of energy. Uh, and, you know, it was hard to say no because he, he had a great vision for the company and he had great talent assembled and, uh, you know, he was just growing the company and he asked me to come along and help grow it. And uh, I did, and I had a lot of fun and uh, made a lot of, you know, uh, good friend. And hey, it was, wasn't really about money. Uh, it was more about getting back and doing something with a group of people that I had a lot of respect for. And uh, mm -hmm. still talk to a lot of them today, and they're, and they're all great. Uh, that company ended up getting bought by Accenture. Um, and so then it sort of became what it wasn't when I was there, but uh, that's okay. Accenture is a good firm too, but not my cup of tea. When you have your agency, it's always, you know, a, a top challenge to recruit A players, mostly because you don't have the budget uh, to convince yeah, them yeah. to come and, and work for you. While these companies, I mean, they, some of them are funded and yeah, they have huge funds. They can allow to pay people, you know, six figures a year. And you just wanted to be part of, you know, uh, that dream team and maybe even make a stint there and, and bring these lessons back to your, your own businesses. At that time, did you want it to go afterwards in entrepreneurship again? Or were you like, okay, I might just stay in the corporate world, as per se? Yeah, no, the corporate world uh, isn't for me. Uh, they probably don't want me and I probably don't want to spend much time there. It's, it's just a different, um, 
it's just different. It's not bad. Um, you know, I would meet, I would meet CIOs at Fortune 500 companies and they'd be like, oh, wow, you know, you have, you have such an awesome job. I, I, yeah, I wish I could do what you do. And I, I think, damn. I was thinking the same thing about that guy. I mean, that's a cool job. You get paid a million dollars a year. You've got this big IT department. That must be easy. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think the corporate world ever had a lot of appeal to me. Um, I, I left Pillar to do another startup with some guys that I really believed in. They had a, a really big vision. It was in transportation and logistics supply chain. And... Um, here again, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we I, somewhere I have on my uh, stored files, you know, pictures of two or three of us sitting around in a basement office. It's like a dungeon in uh, in Sunnyvale. Uh, we were in Sunnyvale, California. No, no, we were in Palo Alto. We were in Palo Alto when we started, and uh, you know, boom, we got it to work, and it got up and running, and got under sale. Uh, I've often said that my attention span is like in the zero to $100 million revenue range. And the reason is I like that. I like that zero. I like that zero zone because you have, well, you don't have much, but you have all the freedom to innovate and create. And it's kind of all on you. Hmm. By the time most companies, most tech companies, by the time they hit somewhere around, let's just call it a hundred million dollars in revenue and you've hit that number a couple of times. Um, and I know it's a long way from being a billion, and I'm not talking about valuation, I'm talking about money coming in the door, money going out the door, 100 million bucks. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the work has to do around improving processes and improving, just improving everything. And yeah. it's interesting work, but it's not like, it's not like going into the, to the dungeon basement office in Palo Alto going, man, this is going to be huge. Here's what we have to do today. Mm -hmm. so, at a hundred million bucks, you need people with longer attention spans than I have. Uh, and so that's kind of always been my range. So how, how different was it? Because, yeah, it's like, um, I mean, hundred million annual run rates on uh, that. That's yeah. It's like in people paying you for logistic and transportation, who were uh, your clients and also like, Tell us a bit more about if there's some phases in the game, let's say from zero to 1 million, from one to 10, 10 to 50 and 50 to 100. Is, is that how a company change and how much employees and what changes exactly through these uh, growth phases? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and when I think about it, I think I probably have some notes written somewhere. I don't think money is the right proxy. Uh, I don't think it's the right KPI. KPI for thinking about these phases, but you're exactly right about the phases of growth from a startup. So, uh, and I find that it usually equates to the number of people uh, in the company. So uh, I, I've used this question when I lecture to MBA classes, people can get an MBA in entrepreneurship now, which is kind of mind blowing to me. Uh, I ask, you know, if you're doing a startup, you and, you and your partner, the, you've got a startup, uh, who is the first per and you need to hire you need to hire an employee you're going to hire your first employee um, the question is simply who do you hire as your first employee and i'll speed things along for the podcast and people are like well maybe a lawyer uh, an accountant accountant's a popular pick that's good good idea uh, software developer and i'm like no the answer is in my experience you the first person you hire is whoever will take the job Right. Because, you know, somebody wants a job and they come in and they see you and you're sitting there in a folding chair and they're like, um, how am I going to tell my wife that I just took a job and it's you? There's no company here. It's just you. So they have to be pretty big risk takers mm. when you and that sort of continues for the first I used to I usually use 25 people. So the first 25 people, you know, them you get a chance to meet them, you probably interview them yourself, you sit around and bullshit over the conference table about all kinds of the meaning of life, direction of the company. Mm -hmm. And at about 25, you start having jobs you need filled. So you're like, oh, we need an IT manager. Let's hire an IT manager. So somebody writes up a job description that's usually pretty bad if I'm writing it, but it's kind of like, we need somebody that fits this. 
Mm-hmm. And that starts to happen between 25 and 50, 25 and 100 people. Now you're, you're hiring people for a job. Uh, after 100, sometimes sooner, but definitely after 100, um, you now look around your business and you have an organization. So you have a VP of HR and you have, you know, you have functional managers and your CTO wants to hire staff and he's hiring people that you've never even met. So you're, you know, you're walking around the office, you're looking at the company Slack channel and going, who the hell is this person? I don't even know who this person is. They work for us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so those, those phases all have distinct differences in the company culture and how you have to manage and how you have to lead in a company like that. So uh, your stages of growth are very real. And to me, it's always been about uh, headcount. Yeah, headcounts. Definitely important. Well, in my opinion, especially when you're in the agency game, which we'll uh, get to yeah. in the moment, like it's it's a game of A players. How many A players can you get? And in my opinion, you get one out of 10 that you recruit. And yeah, that means that nine others need to be let go of normally or eight or seven if you have a good nurturing program. Uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. th- this is this is kind of uh, interesting. Just to close down on Zengistics, um, you exited that one. Uh, is the company still existing, or? Uh, the, yeah, the company actually the company was acquired. So it was acquired by a uh, company out of Canada. Uh, I left before that acquisition uh, happened, and my role there, I was, I was kind of back to being a hired gun. I was brought in specifically to get that business up and running. The initial goal was to get to $100 million in revenue. Um, I knew the business and we got in and we persecuted the business really hard. It was a venture back mm-hmm. deal, pushed it really hard. Uh, it was almost five years of you know, typical startup brutality, uh, but it wasn't my thing. You know, I was, okay. I was there, but it wasn't mine. And so... We hit our goals and we got to a good stopping point. I said, you know, I'm out. We've got a good leadership team. Somebody else can take it from here. Uh, and by that time, I had I had become very passionate about the idea of Code Exitos. So uh, yeah. it, was, it was time for me to go. I'd, I'd found a new path. Yeah, it seems it was a smooth transition because you founded um, Code Exitos in 2018 and you were fully out of Zengistics. So... I guess you, why, why did this project became so interesting to you? Because it's an agency, it's a software agency. You outsource the work uh, in LATAM, which is a very good idea, in my opinion, being in LATAM myself. Mm -hmm. Why did you become so passionate about that one? Um, So I had some personal connections into Central America. Uh, I spent a lot of time here and, you know, Let's face it. There's some there's some economic uh, hurdles to cross here, and I was I'd reached the stage of my life where I wanted to. I'm I'm not going to retire. I mean that's not in my DNA. Um, so I wanted to find something that was more fulfilling from uh, for other reasons, and I was familiar with Latin America and Central America in particular, is where I'm sitting now, and. You know, I got, I'll spare you all the details. I went through a whole bunch of what if scenarios about different businesses, some of them pretty obvious and some not. So, uh, and then I actually had the need for some software developers. And I'm like, well, hell, if I'm going to spend money on outsourced software development, I'll just do it in Honduras. And uh, I really couldn't find an agency, to use your model uh, or term, I couldn't really find an agency that I had much confidence in. And what I noticed was, there were really smart men and women here, but I had this longstanding belief, Carlos, that for a technologist to be, what separates the good ones from the great ones is you need, there are two things that are critical. First thing is uh, you have to be on a good team. Uh, and this is very true in athletics, right? If, if you're, two times better than the next best person on your football team, you're not going to play your best game every day. You need to be on a team where you're pushed. Um, The second thing you need is you need quality work. 
So if the only job opportunity you do as a spur developer is to write some shitty back office insurance software for a big bank that, you know, an insurance company doesn't care anything about software technology or entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. How can you possibly get any better? Mm -hmm. So quite simply, it was like, wait, the skills there and the desires there, we just don't have the opportunity uh, to exercise that. Of course, I'm living in the United States, the lifelong tech entrepreneur, and, you know, we're scraping people up anywhere we can for, for developers. I source work all over the world, uh, Russia, India, Eastern Europe. Uh, I mean, you can't beat the time zone. And so I'm like, wait a minute, why are we, why are we killing ourselves flying halfway around the world, working 12 hours out of sync when there are, you know, 250 million people just south of North America, duh. Uh, let's take advantage of that. So that's what we're doing down here. All our clients are, our clients are in, in only the United States and Canada, some in Europe. Uh, we stay really close to time zone synchronicity. Um, and yeah, we, we design, build and launch digital products for people. It's a ton of fun. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question directly. <laughs> yes, yes, kind of. Well, I mean, but I'm still curious why Honduras and like, have you spent some time vacationing there? Is that what inspired you? Um, well, no, I was inspired by my wife, who's Honduran, and, you know, my stepdaughter, who's Honduran. Uh, that's a pretty powerful motivator. And they came way before. Uh, so, um, you know, there were family connections and deep personal connections. And I was here more than being a tourist. Mm-hmm. So I had a pretty good, you know, I've been in this part of the country since 2000, late 2010. So, mm-hmm. if I, you know, it's not like a, it's, it's not like I got off the tour bus and said, hey, this is cool. I should buy a house here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, Honduras needs it. There was talent here. Mm-hmm. So why not? Yeah, Venezuela too. And well it's the current situation right now the wife of my brother is from Honduras my wife is is Mexican and I mean I've traveled like throughout uh, Platam um, with my wife in the the past couple of years and yeah lots of talent there Um, for example if I compare with Filipinos you know like uh, Latin people they have a bit more thinking you know like uh, more critical thinking and you know they they have more I don't know personality which is um, essential in work you know you need to be creative you need to have an opinion on things and you know uh, entrepreneurship in in your blood Uh, I've been to Philippines as well by the way Um, Mm -hmm. I've been fascinated by you know talent and where to search it in the world in the past couple of years I found a couple of hub and LATAM is still not on my radar right now Um, I do have uh, Serbia and the, the Baltics you know as probably number one when it comes to talent and also Tunisia, Algeria, and, you know, like North Africa. Africa, surprisingly enough, yeah. also if you search, there's like very good talent, very good critical thinkers in there. And also they, they don't um, ask like uh, for as much as, you know, Canadians and US, which is always the basis. The basis is price quality, right? India is still very good right. also. Uh, I avoid Philippines. I avoid a bunch of other regions in the world, but yeah, especially Philippines. Um, what made you, because I guess you did your own work on, on that level too. Like, for example, on my side, you know, like, yes, I get to talk to uh, Mexicans sometimes, Costa Ricans, I interview them, but somehow they don't pass um, the initial test, you know, the communication, they just don't communicate as much, let's say, which is a, essential criteria so what exactly other than the time zone which is surmountable in in some aspect but other than that what core skills have you found culturally speaking that these folks had yeah i think um so i always we always talk about hiring for attitude you can teach skills um you know, here in Central America, what we see are a lot of, you know, really honest, hardworking people that have a good work ethic and just good integrity overall. Mm. Um, you know, it's not to say the rest of the world is full of liars and thieves, but um, 
our clients are really happy working with our team and our team is pretty open about, you know, understanding their deficiencies and working to improve them. So my approach has been less about where can I get the highest skill per dollar spent? And I believe that what we do, we build products for, for entrepreneurs. So our clients are all pre-seed, A round, B round entrepreneurs. And it's, it's a, as you know, it's a deeply personal and intimate thing. So we have very low turnover. Our team works with our clients. Our clients work with us for three months, six months, a year, so now more than a year. Uh, and our, our team is fantastic about that. So I think it's about the people first. And so there's nothing wrong with Eastern European developers. Uh, although it's unfortunate what you know the Ukraine and the Russian uh, communities are going through, mm-hmm. um, but it's well, there's nothing wrong with Indian developers. But it's hard as hell to go there and spend any meaningful amount of time. It you know it takes a long time. It's expensive. Uh, it's just a it becomes a barrier, uh, and it's a barrier I don't want to deal with. So we have you know we have a client coming here on Monday. They're visiting from the U.S., uh, from Boston, Massachusetts. They're coming here on Monday. They're flying in Sunday night. They're going to be here Monday and Tuesday with the team. And then they're, they're going on. I mean, they can, you can do a two-day trip here. And I think that's true of most of Latin America. You get way down in Argentina, and then it gets to be really hard. So for me, it's all about uh, FaceTime, you know, access time. So like Uber can was, we, uh, was coded initially in Mexico City, for example? Um, mm-hmm. why, why not Mexico, uh, which is nearer and which is culturally nearer also than the States? Why not Mexico? Yeah. No, I, uh, don't get me wrong. I love Mexico and our design studio. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with uh, a design studio called Blue Pixel. And uh, Maria is awesome. Our team's awesome. And they're, you know, they're out of Mexico City. Um, For me, I had personal connections to Honduras. Uh, we're going to be opening Spark Center, Spark Spaces, our, our design center, our development center, as we refer to as a Spark Space. Mm-hmm. Um, we have two in Honduras, and that's probably the limit for Honduras. And then we're looking at other countries in Central and South America. So it's not like we're exclusively Honduras in our, in our footprint. Uh, our U.S. team, and we have people in the U.S., Our U.S. team is made up mostly of more senior developers, 10 to 15 years of experience, and they tend to be uh, remote, mostly remote. So, um, but we have a, a growing cohort of U.S.-based developers. So we're sort of geographic agnostic as long as we can maintain the time zone. Yeah. What do you think about the, the future of uh, Latin startups such as Rapi? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I've been I've been so busy for the last three years getting Codex, you know, up to where we are today that I haven't had a lot of time. Um, but it's funny you ask. I'm starting to track the, the Latin uh, VC and startup community a little more closely. Uh, I probably don't know enough right now to have an informed opinion, uh, other than to say that what I see in Central America looks a lot like the U.S. startup environment did 25 years ago mm-hmm. and by that i mean we have um there there are three drivers in my mind there you have a, a talent pool and you have an entrepreneurial skill set and you have an investor pool and so what i see a lot of in latin america is not very good entrepreneurship not a lot of experience in building commercial quality digital products whether it's iot or software um, And then high net worth individuals, typically family money, uh, they're not what we would consider to be smart money investors, right? They're still more um, patriarchal in, in the way they want to do an investment. It's like, hey, I'll give you money, but you have to do exactly what I say. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, as, as an outside observer, we've got to get over that hump. And I've, I've talked to some people who, you know, they... 
they want to be investors, but they want to control the investment. And I'm like, well, no, you've got to let the uh, entrepreneur do that. And they're like, well, wait, if I do that, they'll just spend the money. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. But if you if you make their life terrible, then they're going to fail anyhow. So oh, yeah. uh, we, we've got to, we've got to get those three things. It's a uh, it's topic I'm spending more and more time. So I don't have any bright answers, but I I think that it's I think that it will be. Um, it can be a good market. It can be a great global market. And a lot of other people have already recognized that. So I think it's going to grow, but it's, you know, it's, it's going to take a while. Yeah. Same here. I have similar opinion. And where do you think um, outsourcing is going in the next few years? What are the trends? Well, um, it depends on who you ask and it depends on what, model uh they're invested in so i have friends who consider themselves near shore offshore outsourcing we don't use any of those terms to describe our work uh, we we consider ourselves remote teams right um and so our perspective is a little different than so like when I'm in Guadalajara with my friends, I see a lot of Indian uh, businessmen who come over and they bring the Indian outsourcing model and they've set it up in Guadalajara. Um, okay, cool. I mean, it's a business model and it works. Um, and there's a, there's a market for it. It's just not the market that, that we're in. We're, we like to be, <laughs> maybe it's our own, you know, my own uh, arrogance or self-importance, but we tend to be more of a, of a um, consultancy, uh, okay. a studio, uh, than an outsourcer. Yeah, I would say the same with top leads. You know, um, I'm not focused on one specific place in the world, uh, but yeah, I tend to try to fetch the best uh, remote talent there is out there um, for the the right prices. Right, there's always a price in the market, and that's that's what I'm trying to achieve. Um, now, if we talk about code exitos and, you know, there's the word exitos in the, the, the brand, which is kind of, yeah, like we were, were Spanish, it's Latam. Um, where do you want to take the business in the next five to 10 years? Um, yeah, five to 10 years. So, you know, we, we have plans to be a hundred year company and we, we built the organization that way. So code exitos as a core product development studio, uh, we hope it's around for 95 more years, at least. Um, Needs to. And, um, but we'll be involved more directly in investing in entrepreneurial efforts here in Latin America and nice. uh, probably look a little bit more like an incubator or an accelerator or, or have a function that serves that way. Sure. Uh, and I also want to spend a little my time while I still am actively working um, maybe helping the investor community here in Latin America get a little more comfortable with early stage uh, venture-like investing. Because uh, you need all three of those things to come together. You need good entrepreneurs, good technical pool, and uh, smart money. And so, you know, we'll chip away at all of those things. Nice. If you have one advice to give a new founder, what would that be? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, I don't have one piece of advice. I, I give them maybe two or three layers of advice. The, the, the most important thing is take care of your family, uh, your spouse, your children, whatever, take care of your family. It sort of goes without, you tell entrepreneurs to take care of themselves. We're all, you know, pathological optimists and we're going to work too hard and do a bunch of bad things, but um, it's okay if you do it yourself, but but you, you've got a family that's involved. And so pay attention to that. that that's the first piece of advice. Um, when it comes to business advice, I would say that what's helped me the most is everyone's interesting if you give them a chance to be interesting and they may be valuable to you someday, but not today. So mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in networking and getting to know people and, you know, it's not like you have to get something today, but just, you know, build your network. It's simple. Yep. And, and that, that I think is super easy to do now with the technology that we have and you can keep track of people and 
you know, be okay. thoughtful and listen to their stories. LinkedIn's a great way to do it. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's usually the advice that's top of mind for me. It's very good advice. Take care of your family and yeah, show people that they're worth and develop your network because it keeps expanding, right? And also the more love you give to your family, the more it goes out in the world, right? So it's, I think that's super important as well. Thank yeah, you, agreed. Carlos, uh, for, for being here. Lots of lessons, lots of insights. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, um, so my email address, and you can you know post this somewhere where people can read it, but it's carlos at codexitos.com. Uh, our website is codexitos.com. So you can go there and see the website. You can learn more about this painting and our Creative Fellows Program. That we're, we're very proud of that. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn and then there it's under my English, Charles Fry. You can find me on LinkedIn and, and connect there. And, uh, I'm always happy to know new people. All right. I'll let you go to your meeting, Carlos. You've got to run. I'll see you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye.